Hey crew, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to build on our knowledge on uh, second derivatives. The last video we talked about second derivatives, but just in the context of really themselves. You know, what do they mean for a graph? Well, they can indicate points of inflection. They, if we don't have points of inflection, we could still have intervals of concavity changing. Uh, but we never talked about second derivatives in the context of relative extrema. Yeah, we only talked about second derivatives last time in the context of intervals of concavity and points of inflection. Um, I think there was one problem where I alluded to uh, second derivatives and their implications for, for relative extrema, uh, but now we're going to go at that concept full throttle. What do second derivatives imply for relative extrema? In other words, how, do we how can second derivatives help us classify relative extrema? You know? So let's, let's look at the statement of what's called the second derivative test. Let, let's have a function for which f prime of c, in other words, that's a critical number, f prime of c is zero, and the second derivative exists everywhere on some open interval containing c. Now, as it turns out, I'll explain all this with a picture, but here it is in words for now. If your second derivative is positive, then c f of c is a relative min. If f, of, if f double prime of c is negative, then that's its relative max. And if f double prime of c is zero, finally, the SDT, fa SDT fails, and we use the first derivative test to determine whether or not it's a relative min, relative max, or neither. Yeah, so, we were sort of using this on problems in the last video, right? We, I think we use it for part of one, Yeah. part of one of the problems. But yeah, you may be thinking, you know, why do we need a, a second derivative test? Well, why do we need an SDT? I mean, uh, the FDT seems like it gets the job done pretty well, right? Why do we need this extra test to test uh, test for relative extrema, or classify it relative extrema. Moreover, look, this is more restrictive. This test is more restrictive than the uh, first derivative test. For the first derivative test, uh, I could test whether f prime c was zero or undefined. Or undefined, but for the second derivative test, you can only test if f, f prime c is zero. So again, you know, what's the use of it then if it's more restrictive and we already have a perfectly good tool in place, the FDT, to classify relative extrema? Why do we need this further tool to classify relative extrema? Short answer to that is oftentimes the computations are much easier, even though we've got this more restricted case. Now, what does all this mean in terms of a visual? What does this mean in terms of a picture? Well, let's uh, look, at this, look at this piece of a graph here. This graph is always concave. Always concave up. In other words, the sign of f double prime on that piece is always um, positive. Positive. Yeah, second derivative is positive means it's concave up. Now, suppose I know that that point is c f of c. Suppose I knew the value, pretend I didn't have this picture, okay? Pretend I, I knew that c f of c was some relative extrema, but I didn't know if it was a relative min or a relative max. But suppose I also knew, and without a picture, that f double prime was positive at that point. So we're doing a bit of detective work here. I know that f prime of c is zero. I know the slope is zero at that point. And I also know that the graph needs to be concave up on the piece of the graph that that point is on. Okay. So with those two things in place, if the slope is zero at that point, and that point is on a piece of the graph that's concave up, then that point has to be a relative. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what this first condition is saying, this picture here. Has to be a relative minimum, minimum just by way of those two pieces of detective work. Slope is zero, and it's on a piece of the graph that's concave up, it must be a relative min. Likewise for this illustration here, which nicely illustrates statement two, this piece of the graph is always concave down. Always concave. In other words, computationally, f prime is always, sorry, f double prime is always negative. Always negative. So, 
If I know that my point, C, F is C, has a steepness of zero on the graph, if I know that C, F of C, F of C is on a piece of the graph that's concave down, so slope of zero on a piece of the graph that's concave down, it has to be a, max. a relative max. That's exactly what this is illustrating. And I'm not going to do a visual for three, but if uh, your second derivative is zero, you need to fall back on your first derivative test. Okay. Um, this just means it fails, it's inconclusive. And you got to fall back on the more powerful, but oftentimes more laborious first derivative test. So the benefit of this is notice uh, you don't have to do interval testing with this method. You just need to know some values. What is the sign of f double prime at that point? And boom, you're done. So the second derivative test isn't really a good measure for testing saddle points, then? Uh... Uh, no. No, no, no. So it does have some restrictions again. Uh, f, f prime of c has to be zero right. for this to be meaningful. For example, this right here is a relative max, right? Uh, yes. And our first derivative test will definitely show that. That is a relative max. The slope, the, the slope of the graph is positive to the left and negative to the right. Hallmarks of a relative max. But the second derivative doesn't exist there. Okay. Even if it did, this graph is always, except for that point, is always concave. Concave. Concave up. But that, if it's zero, that, that only works for, uh, that only indicates a relative max. Gotcha. Not a relative max. So yeah. that's why I say that the first derivative test is more powerful because it allows for you testing um, not only if, where f prime is zero, but also where f prime is undefined. Um, the only reason you'd prefer the SDT over the FDT is for the SDT, you don't have to do that many computations. Okay. You can speed things up quite, quite, quite nicely. So here's the problem illustrating just that. Okay, so I want to find and classify all relative extrema, and I want to use the SDT, the second derivative test, as much as possible. So first things first, I need what kind of values? Uh, so critical values. C values, which are critical values, critical numbers. So let us look at my f prime. f prime, when I derivatize, is going to be 15x to the fourth plus 15x squared, yes? Yep. I can make that a little nicer, put it in factored form by pulling out a negative 15x squared, and that leaves me with x squared minus 1. x squared minus 1. So this guy equals 0. At what values? Um, zero, negative 1, 0, and positive 1. Negative 1, 0, positive 1. As we know well, now well know, these are my critical numbers, my c values. The values that make the first derivative either zero or undefined. I don't have to worry about the undefined case because this is a nice polynomial. Now then, I find my second derivative. Now what is that? Um, that is, let's see, that is negative 60x cubed. Negative 60. Plus 30x x cubed plus plus 30x. So we can factor out a 30x. We can factorize that. So we can take out a negative 30x. Yeah. Take out that negative 30x. That's x squared minus 1 again. Oh. Uh -huh. x squared minus 1. Do I have to worry about setting this equal to 0 for this problem? Um, I only set the second derivative equal to 0 or undefined when I'm trying to find what? Oh, inflection points. So we're not looking for inflection points. Yeah, this question is just asking me to find and classify all relative extrema. So we just need to find where it's concave up and concave down. Right. I've already found my relative extrema. Well, potential relative extrema. Okay. Because remember, just because C is a critical number doesn't mean it indicates a relative min or a relative max. Right. Could be just a cell. Now let's say, you know, negative 1, F of negative 1. It's also considered 0, f of 0. 
And one f of one. These are the points that I need to classify as being a relative min, a relative max, or neither, yes? Yep. Now, for the second derivative test, all I have to do is take these c values and stick them into what? Um, stick them into the second derivative and see whether it's positive or negative. Absolutely. So if I just work left to right, f double prime of negative 1. I stick that in here into the factored form because the factored form is easier. Yeah. I get yeah. negative 30 times negative 1. Yeah. Times 0. Uh, times 0. Ah, times 0, that's... Oh, that's supposed to be 2x squared, not x squared. Right. 30x times 2x squared. Negative 30x all times 2x. Oh, I see. We had a little computational boo-boo. Okay. Yeah. That, okay, that, that's making... So I don't have a zero there. I have rather... Um, whatever that is. <laughs> negative 2x. Positive so, 1. Positive 1. That's so going to be positive. So the takeaway, I don't really care about the number itself. I just care about what kind of number it is. The sign. And yeah, it looks positive. It's positive. What this tells you immediately... Notice, I didn't, I didn't have to do any interval testing at all, but I know now immediately that this is a relative what? Since, that, since we got a positive number, that means it's a relative uh, uh, minimum. Right. So, you, remember, a loose way to remember it, f prime being positive means f is concave up, and things that are concave up have to indicate a minimum. Gotcha. So positive means concave up, means relative min. Likewise, negative second derivative means concave down. Nice. Concave down things, yeah. think of a downward facing parabola, gotcha. indicate and max. relative max. So that's the offhand way of remembering this whole stuff. Concave up spells out cup and cups have relative minimums, like shapes of cups. You could use that as a... Hey, the Flister Pump, yeah. you use whatever works for you. Cups, whatever, whatever tickles your fancy, I suppose. So, we immediately know that this is a relative... Minimum. Relative min. And with that, we're pretty much done. We just have to find the value of f of negative one. Mm -hmm. And after we do that, we're done. How about... 1 half of 1. Again, I don't have to do any interval testing like I did for my first derivative test. All I do is I take 1, I throw it in my second derivative, and I check the sign of the number that pops out. What do I get when I stick 1 in there? What's the only difference? Um, the sign, I guess. So negative it's, it's, it's negative 30, 30 but not times, times negative 1 this time. But positive 1. Positive 1, of course, we still have positive 1 on the inside because yeah. we square that 1. So negative. So. Because 1 made the second derivative negative, it has to be on a piece of the graph that is concave down. down. Things that are concave down must have what on the top? A relative max. Yeah, relative max sitting right on the top. So this here is a relative max. This is why we like the second derivative test, because we don't have to do any annoying uh, in interval testing. We just get boom, it is popped out. Sometimes, unfortunately, the test doesn't doesn't work or it's not it doesn't give us anything definitive for example what is f double prime of zero? Oh, that's just going to be zero looking at the non-factored version of the second derivative yes f, if when and if the second derivative is zero the sdt test fails it's inconclusive yeah. so we can say sdt is inconclusive Okay, so we're going to need to use the first derivative test on that thing then? Yes, we're going to have to use the FDT. So, hmm, let's see here. But it has to be, it can't be from negative 1 to 1. It's, um, we're testing negative 1 to 0 and 0 to positive 1. Right, yeah. so, let's, so let's quickly do our first derivative test. Okay. A little bit to the left of yeah. that point, the interval negative 1 to 0. A little bit to the right of that point, zero to positive one. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah. yeah. What is the sign of f prime? Huh. Here, here's f prime. If we want, we can factorize. Making a 
one's worth of factions. Oh, it's not too bad once you... Actually, you don't even have to factor this. But you can factor if you want. You know, X minus one, X plus one. Okay. Oh, it's really just worried about science. We're just worried about science. If I take a negative one half... Yeah. And I stick it in... Let's use a different color. If I take negative one half and stick it in here... What is that first term? Positive or negative? It's negative 15 times a positive one fourth, so that's negative. Positive times a negative is negative. That's How about in there? Negative minus a negative, so negative. Negative as well. What about here? It's a negative plus a positive, so positive. Positive. What's a negative times a negative times a positive? Positive. That's a positive. Yeah. Uh, All right. Zero to one. What's a natural choice for a positive? A one test value. Half. Positive one half. If you take that, stick it in here. Let's do the same thing. That's gonna be negative. Again. Negative. Negative again. Negative? Oh, I see. And positive, yeah. And? Oh, so the exact same thing. So that has no change. All right, there's no change in the slope properties. Gotcha. It just stays increasing on here to here and keeps on increasing from the, on the next nice. interval. Nice. So does that indicate a relative min, a relative max, or something else? Something else. What is that something else? It's called a saddle point. Yes. And once again, a saddle point's critical numbers are no. Well, critical numbers indicate saddle points, gotcha. but saddle points are not considered relative extrema okay. because relative extrema are considered turning points. Okay. They are where the graph transitions from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. Okay, but technically a saddle point counts as a critical number. No, I mean the point is not a critical number. Oh, gotcha. Uh, the x-coordinate of the saddle point yeah. is a critical number. Gotcha, okay. And that's it? Uh, well, first, let's, let me, let's get these, uh, let's, not, let's not be lazy, let's get what these points equal. What is f1, f of 0, and f of negative 1? Okay, um, you throw negative 1 in, back, back into your original, what do you get? Positive, negative 1, that would be negative 3 times negative 1, so positive 3 plus negative 5, so negative 2? Yeah, negative 2. And how's about these? Well, the zero is easy. That's just zero, 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 and finally, and then that would be negative three plus five, so that's positive two. Positive two, yes. By the way, the shape of this graph, where we're gonna do it, we got a saddle point right there, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, one two is about right there. Negative one two is about yeah. right there. We got a saddle point. This was on a piece of the graph that was concave. Concave down? Or it's concave down at one, two. Yeah, it's concave down at one, two, so it's gonna do something like this. Yeah. Oh, cool. And oh, I should emphasize the saddle nature, of course. Yeah. Saddle, saddle. That's gonna go up. That's a wonky graph. Yeah, it is wonky, but it's fun. So there is negative one, negative two, one, two, and zero, zero. Cool. Any questions? Yeah, that is the power of the SDT. If it applies, we have no real interval testing to worry about, except in the rare case when we have a equaling zero and God do interval testing. With that. Cool. So then, let us see the power of the SDT in action when it's acting on real world optimization problems. What do we have here? Well, I'll tell you. We have a Norman window being constructed by adjoining a semicircle to the top of a rectangular window. Find the dimensions of the window of maximum area if we only have 18 feet of perimeter to work with. In other words, the perimeter must be 18 feet. This plus this plus this plus all of that must be 18 feet. Okay, so we did some of these in the FDT video, eh? We did, but we uh, this is a bit more involved. Gotcha. The numbers aren't gonna turn out to be so nice, as you'll see. Okay. So, a generic rectangle with a semicircle fitting that generic rectangle. 
I'm going to label the sides of my generic rectangle Y and Y. Okay. On the vertical side, the horizontal side, I'm going to call X. Of so course. The radius would be X over 2? Yeah. No matter what size Norman window I make, out of what size shapes, X and R are always going to have the relationship. Like so. Yeah. Now then, let us get an expression for my constraint. Ooh, let's see here. Um, I know that this plus this plus this plus the perimeter of a semicircle. Oops, I killed off my semicircle. Let's get it back. There we go. I know that that plus that plus that plus this, the outer part of the semicircle must be. 18, right? Must be 18. So we're not including the, like, the upper base, are we? No, 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 no. The perimeter of the window, we're, we're, really, we can throw away this thing in our window. We don't really have to have that line there. Gotcha. We're just drawing that line so we can get this problem under control. Cool. Ugh. But I, I tell you what, this problem is quite a wild problem requiring some... I think it's going to require some quite wild attire. Otherwise, it's no good. Ah, so then, Cowboy Barkley in the house, terminate to Cowboy in this case. I thought she danced off into retirement, sir. That was Hunter Barkley. Oh, yeah. This is Cowboy Barkley. Alright, so let's see here. I know that Y plus Y plus X plus 2 pi R over 2. Over two. Equals 18. Must be 18, yes? Yeah. And as I want to minimize board space, I'm going to call 2 pi over 2, just plain old. Pi r. Pi r, and I'm going to call y plus y. 2y. 2y. I mean, you can simplify that more. We can, because right now it's in how many variables? It's 3. It's in 3. Let's just make that 2. Just 1. Just I do know that r is always equal. 2x over 2. 2x over 2. So that's my constraint, which I can simplify a bit more. I can say that is 2y plus the x factored out, yeah? Yeah, 1 plus pi over 2. 1 plus pi over 2 being 18. So that is my simplified constraint. I've simplified my constraint as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Maximize, maximize, maximize. Let's find a function to maximize. What is the area of that rectangle? Area of the rectangle? Of the rectangle. Um, just x, y. x, y. Area of my semicircle is? Um, pi x squared over 2. Pi r squared over 2, which is the same thing as pi x over 2, the whole thing squared, right? Yes. Over 2. Again, r is always x over 2. Right. So, let's see. What does that come out to be? x, y plus? What is that term when you simplify? Pi x squared over 4. Over 4, and that's all over 2, so this entire thing is over... 8. Over 8. So I've gotten rid of the r for both my constraint and my objective function, but I still have a function of how many variables? 2. 2. So we can make it 1 if we try hard enough. If we do, yes. For my constraint, I know that no matter what x is, Y always has to be what? Um, 18 minus... I don't know, 18 minus that, yeah. Subtract this from both sides. Gotcha, divide by 2. Divide by 2. So we get... A, no matter what, has to be. X times all that stuff. Plus pi x squared over 8, correct? Yeah. Okay, let's do some more stuff with this. I'm going to break that up into how many fractions? Um, you can break that into two fractions. Into two? Yeah. And before that, you know, I can distribute the x. I can take the x, stick it in front of there, take the x, multiply that x by it with it to get an x squared. 
So all in all, I have 18x minus x squared times that all over 2, yes? Mm -hmm. And then I can break up, like he was saying, into two fractions. Mm -hmm. So a can be 18x over 2 for the first fraction mm -hmm. minus minus all that plus this. So it may not look like it, but this is actually the graph of a polynomial. Okay. Here's my x squared term, here's another x squared term, here's an x term. And 18 over 18 over 2 is what? Just 9. Yeah, so just plain old 9x. So when I have it written in nice polynomial, you know, addition and subtraction form, that's my this is my a of x. A is a function of one variable, just x. This is the fine time to find the what? The critical numbers? Critical numbers by way of the first derivative, yes. Okay. So I got a prime being 9, yes? Mm -hmm. Minus 2x times that over 2. Yeah. The 2 is cancel. Just leaving me with x times that stuff, right? Yeah. And finally, plus, what's my last term? Um, you. x over 4, or pi x over 4. Yes, pi x over 4. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Now, I don't like, well, I'm trying to find when this is equal to what? Zero. Right. So this equals zero when so I'm going to go on to the other side of the board, write down the same thing. So 9 minus x times all that. Okay. I think I got it. I'll double check. Okay. So 9 minus x times 1 plus pi over 2 plus pi x over 4. Over 4. Let me double check and make sure that was right. Sorry, I'm getting out of the shot here. Hey guys, looks good, looks good. This equals 0 when 9 equals what? When 9 equals just all that to the other side. Migrated to the right, absolutely. 1 plus pi over 2 minus pi x over 4. Over 4. Now, I don't like having fractions like that around. How can I get rid of that 4? Uh, multiply both sides by 4. Multiply everything by 4. 4 times the left. 4 times the right. Gives me. So 36 is equal to. 36 equals what? 4x. Uh, 4x, right? Mm -hmm. Plus 2 pi. 2 pi. Minus pi x. Okay, I'm, I'm multiplying this by 4. I'm going to just keep the 4 there for now. Yeah. 1 plus pi over 2 minus pi x. Now this 4, I'm going to multiply the stuff on the inside by. Okay. This, multiply the 1 by it. Uh, multiply the pi over 2 by it. So I get 36 equals x all times 4 plus 4 plus uh, just 2 pi. 4 plus just 2 pi. Yeah. You're still leaving the x out? Yeah. Oh yeah, because can, we, can, we can divide it later. Gotcha. Minus pi x. Oh. Now I can do what? Um, factor pi out an x on the right side. Factor out x on the right. Actually, I can factor out x from everything. Yeah. So really, we're not doing calculus now. This is just a really nasty algebra. Thing. Yeah. So we have four plus two pi minus, minus pi. pi minus pi. Yeah. Four plus pi. Absolute. Nice. So you then just divide both sides by four plus pi. Four plus six. pi. So x is exactly equal. This is my what kind of number? Made the first derivative of zero, so it's a critical number. 
36 over 4 plus pi. Does that look good? Yeah. All right. Now, someone help me out. Use your calculator. Approximate that to two decimal places. Okay. Um, I got 5.04. 5.04? Yeah. 5.04 and the dimensions were feet, correct? Yes. 5.04 feet. Now, question is, does X maximize A, does X minimize A, or is it a saddle thing that doesn't either? We gotta find out. We gotta find out. We don't know. We gotta find out. Here's my A prime. And the way we did it last time, remember, we uh, did our first derivative test for those other two optimization problems, or the three optimization problems, actually, on the previous video. Uh, but this time, let's use the second derivative test. Here is my A prime, yes? equals all this stuff. If that is a prime, what is a double prime? What is my second derivative? Huh. Um, What's the derivative of nine? Zero. Yes. What's the derivative of all this stuff? Negative x times that? Oh, I'm just that, that, but without the x. Yeah, right. so negative all of that, yes? Yeah. yeah. Plus pi over four. Oh, that was easier. Plus was pi close. over four. And you, you know, even if you didn't have a calculator, negative one minus pi over two plus pi over four is the same thing as negative one minus what? Pi over four. Minus pi over four, which is what kind of number? It's a constant. It's a constant number. What kind of constant number? Um, a negative number. Yes. Yeah. It is some negative number. So it's always concave down? Right, because we just determined f double prime is always negative. So f, plain old f, is always positive. Well, it's always concave down. Concave, yeah, always positive, it's concave down. Yeah. And so, if 5.04 represents a place on A where the slope is zero, and we know that the graph of, the, the, of F is concave down, then that place where X is 5.04 has to represent... Oh, a relative maximum. Relative maximum, not just a relative max. If it's always concave down... Then it's an absolute max. Absolute max, yes. So, with this in tow, incorporating this into that, we know for a fact that 5.04a of 5.04 is an absolute max. In other words, whatever this is, a of 5.04 is the maximal area we can have given our constraint. Yeah. But this question asks for dimensions, so I suppose we can go around to the other side of the board now. We just need to find x, we need to find y, we already found x, so we just have to find y, and we gotta find r. Are we finding the dimensions or the maximum area? We're on the dimensions. Okay. Oh yeah, we know the maximum area, never mind. Yeah, well, we don't know the maximum area, but we can find it just by plugging in gotcha. 5.04. Well, this question is asking for dimensions, so I need x, I need y, and I need r. Let's we'll start with low hanging fruit. We just found x was 5.04 feet. Yeah. If x is 5.04 feet, what's the next thing I can find quite easily? R. R. What's 5.04 divided by 2? Uh, just 2.52. 2.52 feet. And that is from this fact here. Okay. So we can do 18 minus twice of that minus twice of that. Well, 18 minus twice of that divided by 2 to find y. 18 minus twice of 18 minus, um, no, 18 minus 5.04 divided by 2, right? Well, we've got to do this right here. So y is equal to all of this. Yeah. So we utilize this fact. So someone with a calculator to help me out, take about 10 or 15 seconds, get, get a computation for that. Okay. If you stick 5.04 in for x, okay, right there, what do you get? That I got was also like 2.52. Oh. That's weird. That is a bit weird. So what that means is that we'll have the maximal area norm and window when y is the same size as radius r. In other words, when we can nicely divide our rectangle into two what kind of shapes? 
Um, Scripts. Scripts. Cool. It does make some intuitive sense. Usually maximum uh, values occur when you have these nice shapes like squares uh, and things. But yeah, notice, let's go back to this other board for a second. If you used your FDT, if you used the first derivative test, you would have had to do some interval testing with this number. From 0 to 5.4, you know, take a number, throw it in your first derivative. Um, 5.04 onwards, take a number, throw it in your first derivative, compare the signs. Um, but yeah, our second derivative really helped us out here. Um, and even though, actually for this, actually for this problem, we didn't really need calculus. Because what kind of shape is this right here? A is what kind of shape? Is that a parabola? It is a parabola, and specifically it's what kind of parabola? Facing up or facing down? Facing down. Yeah. Right, and actually we don't, we don't know immediately just looking at this that's facing down. Mm -hmm. But if you take this number here, negate it, mm -hmm. add pi over 8 to it, it'll turn out to be a negative number. Okay. So we'll have a negative in front of our x squared, which means it's facing down. Facing down. Cool. So actually, even with the pre-calculus method, there would still be a fair bit of gotcha. computation involved. Okay. But yeah, notice um, all the problems we've done so far for optimization, the one in this video, the three in the last one, um, all of them were downward facing shapes. In the last video, we had three optimization problems. Both of them were, first two were parabolas facing down. The last one was with the isosceles triangle inside the parabola. Um, but again, the area expression for that was something that was also downward facing. It wasn't a para parabola. It was some parabolish thing. So for all those three, we could have actually shortened the work with our second derivative test. Cool. There's still a lot of work, though. Still a lot of work. Though. But I mean, uh, nothing good in life comes with. Comes yeah. free. Now we got neat windows. You do. You got Norman windows. Cool. Nice Catholic windows that you find in nice churches. Cool. How do you make it stainless glass? Stainless glass? We can do that too, we can maximize the ideal translucence. Okay, we done. Yeah, we're done. <laughs>